So this is uh, kind of a, a festive occasion, Earth Day, um, at least it should be. Um, my presentation isn't really that festive. There are some people that know me in the crowd and I actually am a funny person, but <laughs> I don't have any funny slides. And maybe um, the last few times I've done talks like this, the, the question and answer period is a, a lot more um, entertaining. So. Um, we're at Earth Day, and I don't know how many of you read uh, the news or the scientific news every day, but we're facing a multitude of crises right now um, on the economic front, on the energy front. Um, there's biodiversity issues. We're undergoing the sixth great extinction. Um, there's concerns about climate change. There's social equity. Uh, there's pollution, um, a whole litany of, of problems. And the problems are actually so manifold that it's easy for us to tune them out um, because it's, it's not the way that we evolved to think about these many things. I believe that the only non-sociopathic response to this is alarm. It's, it's okay to be alarmed um, because I am. And uh, so my talks are gonna cover um, a wide range of topics from anthropology to natural resources to human behavior, evolutionary biology, um, energy, environmental issues, and kind of look at a bird's eye view of us and our situation. And um, I, I put my slides as a guide. I don't have any charts or numbers. They're all pictures. So um, it, it's also kind of a grab bag for me what I'm going to say. Um, so first of all, um, all these issues I wanted to thank. This is the first time my parents have ever uh, heard me speak live. And um, I don't think I'm that much smarter than other people, but I think I'm more curious. And so I wanted to thank them. When I was very little, they read to me, bought me every book I wanted, and, and encouraged the, the what about this, what about this. And I think that's uh, either genetic or cultural. I, I thank them. So um, watching the news, we get bombarded on CNN with the Boston bombing or something going on in uh, Greece or uh, Japan. And what I want to do first is talk about first principles because we, we too uh, quickly gravitate towards things that we believe are the case. And I want to just give a real big picture of first principles that apply in nature before I get to talking about the human uh, ecosystem. So first of all, um, organisms are a part of their environment. Um, for most of our history, we were not a, a large part of the environment, but we were a part of the environment nonetheless. We were part of a local ecosystem. Um, there are uh, laws of thermodynamics um, which I'm going to talk about the second and fourth because they're the most interesting. The second law of thermodynamics is there's always a loss when there's an energy conversion. Um, the first law is um, energy is conserved. It's neither created or destroyed. But when the sun hits an uh, African savanna, only 10% of it gets processed by the plants. And when a gazelle eats the plants, another roughly 10% gets processed. And when the cheetah eats the gazelle, there's, there's another loss, and the, the rest of the waste heat goes into the atmosphere. So there's always a loss. Um, in nature, there's something called the maximum power principle, which shows that organisms and ecosystems um, self-organize so as to access an energy gradient um, as best as possible. So in an old growth forest like this, if you take the maximum daily temperature minus the uh, minimum daily temperature, there'll be a very small range on the old growth trees, but on the path or in the field, there'll be much higher temperature differential. These large trees are degrading the sunlight, they're degrading the energy, and they grew to, to be adapted to that. Biology is, is key in the animal kingdom. Um, and there's a concept of, of relative fitness, which is there aren't enough offspring to survive. And those that compete and are better at competing for resources and mates, et cetera, end up passing on more of their genes to the next generation. A peacock um, has this ornate tail that a lot of energy and resources go into, number one. Number two, a predator. 
can see the peacock a lot easier. And number three, if the predator does see the peacock, it's harder for the peacock to fly away. All three of those negative fitness hits are offset by the female's preference for the ornate shiny tail. And this is relatively ubiquitous in nature. Another concept um, is called optimal foraging theory, which is animals need energy. Energy is everything. And they expend energy in order to get energy. And the ratio that they do that is called the energy return on, on investment. Animals that, um, if, if a cheetah chased mice all day long, it might be very successful at getting mice, but there's so few calories per mouse that it would expend more, and that cheetah would, would not have enough calories for itself, for offspring, etc. Some organisms um, have graduated to what's called uh, eusociality or ultrasociality. Um, this is a leafcutter ant. It's very interesting, and you're going to see in about 20 minutes why I'm bringing this up, that um, ants are about 20,000 of the 1 million insect species on the planet, yet they make up half of the biomass, ants and termites together. They have been, become unbelievably um, dominating in the ecosystems of the earth. In fact, the ant and termite biomass is as large or larger than the human biomass on the planet. And there's seven billion of us. They did this because of specialization and comparative advantage where they have a worker class and they have warriors. And it was a division of labor that allowed the social in insects to basically take over ecosystems. So um, those are some biological principles. Now I'm going to move to the, the, the human side of the equation. So this chart um, is a timeline of geologic time on the top, which is four and a half billion years ago. And the little black sliver on the far right is the last 20 million years, which is enlarged in the middle row. And the little black sliver on the right of that is the last 12,000 years enlarged on the bottom. Our species, um, Homo sapiens, has been uh, anatomically the way we are now for around 200,000 years and behaviorally for about 50,000 years. We lived in hunter-gatherer small tribes um, for a very large percentage of that time. The yellow line is from 8,000 years ago to 2,000 years ago. And that's when we developed agriculture. And our population, of course, we can't know for sure, but the best estimates are during that time of the yellow period, we went from 6 million to 100 million people. What happened then is the advent of humans becoming ultra-social. And that was the beginning of us starting to function as a superorganism. It wasn't just a bunch of individuals and tribes. We started to uh, procure agricultural surplus, store it, stay in one place, and that, um, that had major implications, as you're about to see. Of course, you can see where the population chart goes asymptotic. We pretty much hit the energy lottery there um, when we found how to um, extract and use fossil fuels. The section labeled A is when all of our economic laws were written and discovered, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. Why do I talk about evolution? Um, because I think it's important to know where we came from. And uh, it's particularly awkward for me to even have these slides in the United States sometimes. There's been uh, studies done that showed of all the developed nations in the world, um, only one, Turkey, which is an Islamic country, ranks lower than the United States in the percentage of people that believe evolution even happened. Um, I'm going to get back to human behavior in a minute, um, but right now I want to talk about energy because energy is fundamental to the story and how human societies have been built. No matter how you make a cup, you always have a precursor that you need energy. No matter what product there is in society, it uses energy before it reaches its final destination. So human uh, history of agriculture was applying human labor energy um, to get the natural flows from the sun. And this happened for a long time 
until we started to domesticate animals, which had a lot more power. Power is energy per unit time. And we were able to have higher yields and have more surplus, which led to more wages and profits, etc. So then we found oil. And if you remember one slide tonight, this might be one, um, although there's a couple later that I hope you also remember. But <clears throat> oil is basically magic for our society and our civilization. One barrel of oil, which sells for $100, has 5.7 million BTUs of energy potential. If you translate that to work, it's about 1,700 kilowatt hours. The average human working every day generates around six tenths of a kilowatt hour per day. So if you do the math, one barrel of oil displaces 11 years of human labor. We pay that for $100. The average salary in America is $45,000. So one barrel of oil displaces $500,000 worth of some combination of wages, profits, or for most importantly, cheap prices for us. Standard economic texts treat oil the same as they would all these other things. A hundred dollar mouse clicker or some shoes or glasses. In the economic textbooks, those are all things that you can pay for a hundred dollars. In other words, money is what matters. Energy is not important. So the story of industrialization is basically throwing more and more energy at a process. Take, for example, driving a car. If you drive a car rather than walk, you're using, uh, you're getting to where you're going 10 times faster, but you're using between 25 and 30 times more energy. And that doesn't include the roads and the infrastructure. So this, this translation can explain a lot of what underpins our society as we throw more and more primary energy. And in fact, economic growth uh, the last 40 years is over 90% correlated with throwing more primary energy. In the last 12 years, it's 98% correlated. The other components are some productivity improvements and uh, conversion efficiency of power plants, et cetera. So we are living like kings and queens of old um, with our energy subsidy. The average American consumes um, 55 barrel of oil equivalents a year. So given the prior math, that means that we have hundreds of fossil fuel slaves, each of us invisible behind us. They don't talk, they don't complain. Human civilization right now um, requires constant output of 17 trillion watts constantly at one time in order to keep going 24 seven. And if we add more to it, it requires more that other people will have to use in the future. And what I was saying before, and I had my slides mixed up, is these fossil fuel slaves are unseen by most of us. Um, but they do breathe and poop. And we're starting to figure that out. Um, I'm not a climate change expert, um, but I know quite a few people who are. And I think there is some debate on whether we're 60% responsible or 99% responsible for what's happening. But the CO2 levels have not been this high in 15 million years. A lot of it has been taken up by the deep oceans. Um, the oceans have not been this acidic in at least 15 million years. It has major implications. I think even if there's one chance in 10 of the Armageddon climate scenarios, we have to do something. Um, because the stakes are, are so high. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that later. So energy, um, we have plenty of fossil fuel energy left. The climate uh, scientists will say that we cannot afford to burn it. Um, I would say that that is relevant, but that it's also becoming incredibly more expensive. This is a graph of Cantorell oil field, um, one of the four largest oil fields. 
it started to deplete in 1999, and they added um, in, uh, nitrogen injection to push the oil into the center. And it started to decline again in 2004 and 2005, and they did infield drilling and had horizontal uh, nipples to bring the oil from far around. And it looked okay for a while. Now it's in permanent decline. Uh, my friends in, uh, I have a friend who works at Pemex who tells me that in two years, Mexico is going to be an oil importer. They've been an oil exporter to us for a long time. So think back to the um, image of the cheetah, optimal forage thing, theory, energy return on investment. The same concept is relevant in the human sphere. In the 1930s, we would um, drill for oil and spend one barrel of oil to get out 100. And by the 1970s, that ratio was down to 30 to 1. By the year 2000, it was down to 10 to 1 or 11 to 1. And anecdotally now, it's much lower. So it, if the energy return on investment gets to 1 to 1, it doesn't matter if oil is $1,000 a barrel or a $1 million a barrel. If you're spending one barrel to get it, it's not going to help you. Standard economics assumes that energy follows the blue curve, which is the uh, lower marginal cost curve of most goods, which is technology and off-sourcing them to the cheapest places. Gradually, they become so cheap as they, they don't get much cheaper. But they think that happens with oil as well. But oil follows a different curve. We've already found um, the best deposits in the world. And now we are finding more oil, but it's incredibly more expensive. The average extraction costs for oil in the last, since 2002, is up 17% a year. So we've increased our production 1% or 2%. We're now spending $600 billion a year to find it, and oil prices have tripled. So when you talk about peak oil, it's not about um, how much oil there is necessarily, it's how much it costs. One thing about economics that I've learned is that it is efficient. It is supposed to be efficient on maximizing dollars. So it money and transactions and commerce go to where um, the dollars are. And this is consistent with economic theory. Well, what happens then is, is it optimizes for wants and not needs. Um, during the financial crisis 2008, um, when corn and soybean prices were skyrocketing more 2007, the average caloric consumption in America went up from 3750 3,750 calories per person to 3,850. But in Zambia and a lot of countries in Africa that spend 60 or 70 percent of their income on food, they initiated what are called foodless days. They literally could not afford to buy food anymore, partially because of our corn ethanol policy in the United States where 40 percent of our corn crop is going in our cars. So what happens is, yes, the market is efficient but it's going towards an extra 500 calories for someone that's already fat and someone who's starving. So in all of this, you know, we live in the richest country in the world, but I'm talking about crises coming down the road. There are already crises for a lot of people right now. <laughs> Think about the same dynamic about food. If food is optimized towards who can afford it, but not who needs it, we're doing the same thing to the environmental services the ecosystem services of our planet. There was a report out this week that showed that if you account for environmental externality costs, which, by the way, is why I left Wall Street, I found out that we weren't paying these costs of pollution and, and people dying from coal fumes, and none of that was being added into the, the price of electricity. Um, but none of the top 20 industries in the world would be profitable if they had to pay the proper externalities. The top 20 industries in the world would all be running in the red if they had to include environmental costs. Of course, they're not going to, but I'm just saying that that's, that's the dynamic. 
There are so many things we do at the marginal barrel. Oil is worth so much to us, but it costs 50 or 60 or $70 a barrel to get out. So they sell it for 90. They're not gonna buy, pay 50 to get it out of the ground and sell it for 10,000. So many things in our system is like this. We've consumed, killed, eaten 90% uh, of the pelagic fishes in the world um, because we can. If you go into a grocery store, there's tuna on sale for 90 cents a can. Eating tuna for protein is the ecological equivalent of eating lion for hamburger. We're the top of the food chain in the ocean. Seven of the major fisheries in the world, six are severely or extremely over depleted. Um, the global fish catch peaked uh, 15 years ago and has been in decline. So, um, yeah, the festive <laughs> mood kind of changed a little bit. Um, so I want to talk about money, um, which is near and dear to everyone's heart, and it, it's a central part of the problem right now. Um, we talk about wealth, and most people think about stocks and bonds and cash, but all those things are really just a marker for real wealth. And real wealth... Um, is natural capital, which is our rivers and our forests and our oil and natural resources. It's built capital, which is our houses and our schools and our tables and our computers. And that's my house, by the way. Um, there's social capital, which is our friends, our network, our family, our dogs, in this case mine. And there's human capital, which is our skills and our knowledge and our health. And that's me finding a uh, hen in the woods mushroom, and that's my dad um, growing vegetables, which he complains are not worth the time to do, but he still does it. Um, but overlaying this, we have a monetary system that if you think about us finding this pixie dust under the ground that had so much power and so much open space that for a long time we needed more money in the system. This is also not taught in economics, and also the bloggers have it mostly wrong, too. The way that money comes into an existence is a loan and a deposit happen at a bank at simultaneously the exact same time. The fractional reserve thing is kind of a, an irrelevant side part to it. But when you go to a, loan, when you go to a bank and you are creditworthy and you take out a $100,000 loan, that 100000 ends up in your account. Nowhere in the entire system did $100,000 of purchasing power leave the account, leave the system. So all of a sudden, the purchasing power increased. So money literally comes from nothing. And this was not a problem for a long period of time because we had productive ventures and we had open spaces and a lot of new technology ideas. But it's become a problem now. It wouldn't be a problem if when you created money or you created debt, that the ventures that you took on would be so productive as you could pay, the, pay it back. There's something called debt productivity. Since I've been on the planet 47 years, the United States has grown its debt more every year than it's grown its GDP, every single year. And most of the other developed nations have done the same. So if you took on debt and then one dollar of debt and you grew the, your economy one dollar, that would be a one-to-one -one ratio. We've never been close to one-to-one. -one. In fact, now we're at zero. We are growing our debt by two trillion a year, the government, and GDP is flat. Um, it's not just the United States. It's, it's every, most of the developing nations, Brazil, Rus Russia, China, uh, are all following this model, and Europe, as many of you know, uh, are definitely following it. So, how does this relate to energy? Well, energy is magic. And oil, as much as some would say we need to give it up, we, we have no plan to give it up anytime soon, and it is the hemoglobin of society. And what's happening now is 
energy companies require more and more higher oil price in order to pay for their extraction techniques. Goldman Sachs just had a report out last week that said um, by 2015, the break-even price for around 30 or 40 million barrels, which is almost half of world production, is $125 a barrel. On the bottom end, um, or on the top end, societies are, are largely broke. Um, and only the, the top echelon of society um, is, is chugging along nicely. So society can afford less and less. So we have this biophysical gauntlet where energy prices need to go up for the producers and they need to go down for the consumers. Um, and what's happening is the central banks of the world are taking over that problem and they're creating money, buying their own sovereign debt, and they're taking over the role of, of what was prior, the commercial banks. Um, and uh, this could go on for a while, but they are, um, it's never been done before and the size of it is, is pretty um, gargantuan. And it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's a permanent measure. They, they can never withdraw the measures that they've taken. Okay, um, so that's a brief history of um, energy and the economy. And by the way, um, Brian, who introduced me, um, told me what he wanted uh, in this talk, and I didn't really do what he wanted. So he doesn't know any of this, so he's off the hook. Um, but the vast majority of sustainability um, people in renewable energy and government, et cetera, are focused on the supply side. How do we build better renewable energy? How do we um, have a smart grid and integrate things and new technology? I think all that stuff's important, but I firmly believe that looking at who we are and um, where we came from and what our drivers are, are going to pay more dividends. Um, the human brain evolved like other animal brains uh, over millions of iterations and we started with very primitive brain and went up and forward with different structures. Um, the reptilian core on top of that, a, a limbic system, the mammalian brain, which is emotions, etc. And, and the frontal brain is, is um, the neocortex where we think about mortgage payments and college tuition and, and facts on climate change and things like that. I like to think of the way our brain regions interact as the neocortex is the, the man on top of an elephant. Together they can accomplish great things, but sometimes the elephant just goes off and does what he wants. There's a central concept um, to sustainability called a discount rate. A discount rate is how much an organism prefers the present to the future. Um, a discount rate of one is like a goldfish that if you feed it three days and you're going out of town, it will eat all three days in the next five minutes and blow up. Discount rate of zero would be a robot who would live to be 10,000 years old and would care about the year 2500 the same as today. We did not evolve to care about the future beyond our immediate problems. Um, Saber-toothed tigers, chasing us, those are things we respond to. Um, oil depletion and climate change that might happen in an abstract way in 2050 is not what gets us uh, motivated. So our response to um, these things is not a conscious one, it's how we get neurotransmitters and our feelings. And I would argue that these things that I showed before are not what drive us? What drive us are the brain chemicals that we get from acquiring or experiencing those things. Um, shopping, um, free sell, played a lot by someone in this room who I won't mention. Um, when you go to a refrigerator at 11 p.m. and grab some haagen it's not because you're starving. It's because your brain wants some, you're either bored, you want some brain chemical like serotonin or that you get from 
from eating the food. Our entire lives are dictated by these feelings we have. Um, and this has a large bearing on our consumptive behavior. So this is 20 years ago um, when I worked on Wall Street. And I, I was not a banker, um, as Brian said. I was, a, I was in sales and trading. And my job was to manage money for billionaires. And when we got there, I had to call, you could not call on someone worth less than $100 million. This guy's worth 50 million, you can't call him, he's not of our caliber. So when I was pretty young, um, I knew a lot of very wealthy people. And I'm glad that I witnessed that because the clients I had that were worth $200 million said I wanna to get to 300 million and I quit. And then five years later they had 500 million and they were even more uh, into the game. And I saw that they weren't any happier than the $20,000 a year clerks that were processing their trades. Um, not only that, but this happened several times where I would get a call and there'd be some, well, what's IBM stock doing? And it would be, one of my clients would be in the delivery room waiting for his baby to be born and he wanted a stock quote. And it struck me then that they are ostensibly making more money to have a life about the things that really matter, but the things that don't matter have kind of taken over. And I've seen this so much that I can't tell you that it's true. You have to experience it yourself. Maybe some of you have, but I think it's pretty robust. Um, so in a lot of ways, our society has turned into a big gulp, it seems to me. Um, we consume so much but the marginal benefit we get from it, I mean, it's not, for a lot of you young people in the room, if you get a chance to go to an African country or, or to a poor nation, it's, yes, there are people suffering and they don't get enough food, but it's the happiest, healthiest people more often than not. And it's just such a clash when you land in Miami airport or something after being in, in Peru. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the egos of some of the people that are our world leaders, the billionaires, um, are just amazing. Every couple of years you find out that someone has built the longest yacht in the world by 10 feet. They need to then build another one um, two years later. Uh, and it's, it gets back to the, the relative fitness uh, that I talked about in biology. We compete um, given the metrics that society gives us and since I've been alive, yes, you can be respected as a doctor or a priest or a professor, but most people respect digits in the bank because it allows you freedom and, and, and other abilities. So talking about relative fitness, one of my professors did a, um, a study asking people, would you rather have a 4,000 square foot house when all your neighbors had a 6,000 square foot house? Or would you rather have a 3,000 square foot house, smaller house, when your neighbors had a 2,000 square foot house? The vast majority of people preferred the smaller house as long as it was bigger than their neighbors. And this is a large driver of our societal behavior. I forgot the, um, the person who has this quote, but he defines a rich man as someone who makes $1 a year more than his wife's sister's husband. <laughs> and I, you know, there's some truth to that. And there's definitely some truth because I used to be surrounded by people making millions a year. And little tiny, you know, my, my desk was the size of this lectern and guys were on either side of me. And yeah, it was exciting. Um, my second year out of graduate school, I made $400,000. I spent all of it. Did not have one penny left. And that was the life that I had 20 years ago. And now I'm not surrounded by anyone except my girlfriend and we live on a farm and the nearest people we have are farmers that don't have a lot of money and, and definitely don't display it. And it's part, one of the things that I've learned is to kind of choose your, your friends. And yeah, I still have some contacts on Wall Street and um, the half of them that are still talking to me are still pretty, pretty good friends. 
Uh, but yeah, this relative fitness and who you surround yourself by and, and how they pull you is, is very important. This is also another driver. Um, you talk about some of the problems we're facing and, and the five stages of grief. Most people don't get past the denial stage. It just stops right there. Our beliefs are so unbelievably strong that on some of these core issues, um, for example, climate change, facts will not matter. People's beliefs are so strong. They've tested people in brain scans um, that say, I believe in God, and the areas of the ventromedial prefrontal cortex light up. The same way that if I was being tested and I said, I believe this is a glass of water, the same belief activa activation areas in the brain happen. Um, everyone, we have a, a evolutionary predisposition to be optimistic. Um, optimism uh, reduces uh, cortisol, which is a stress hormone. One million out of one million high school students when asked on a uh, placement exam if they were better or worse than average at getting along with other people, a million out of a million. It was not one that didn't. And I'm sure some of you professors here know the 90 some percent of professors think they're better than average. Um, this is a, a human trait and self-deception is rampant in nature. And if you can lie convincingly to yourself, you can certainly do it to other people. And this is a real barrier to sustainability. This is a graph I made from data in a book called The Spirit Level by Wilkinson and Pickett. The bottom line, the bottom uh, is axis is um, wealth inequality. And the left axis is uh, social problems, um, rape, homicide, mental disorder, obesity, prison terms, uh, et cetera. And you can see there's a correlation with all these countries' flags. Japan is on the lowest, and Japan has some major financial and energy problems right now. They don't have any indigenous energy, and they've been printing money like crazy to offset their depression. But they have one of the... Um, the best social health indicators because the society is not that stratified. stratified. Um, there are poor people and there are rich people, but the, the difference is not nearly as great as it is in the United States, which of these countries has the largest wealth inequality. It's my belief that economic growth is over for the United States and very soon for the rest of the world. For most people, economic growth has already been over. Since 2006, GDP, the government statistic of how much we use, has been up 1.5% a year. So we're still kind of treading water, slightly going up. But since 2006, 95% of Americans have seen their take-home pay um, shrink or stay flat. Again, so for most people, um, we've kind of been in a recession for six or seven years. The difference between those two stats is that the top 5% of society has taken all the income gains plus some since 2006. And this is correlated with what the Federal Reserve is doing. They're trying to get the economy going by putting money in the system, but the money just goes into the stock market um, and, and the bond market, et cetera, and people front run it and I diverge. So if you think about this graph, and then just get a little Earth Day thought and say, what if we think about versus the future and other species? Um, we are borrowing from things that we probably don't even recognize. OK, so um, that was a roundabout uh, explanation of, of human energy, economic, and behavior. Now I'm going to try and put it all together. How many know what a monkey trap is? So I don't know that these actually exist in nature, but the concept is that you can trap a monkey if you have um, a container with some food in it, and he'll put his hand in the container, and all he has to do is let the, the banana go. But he'll grab onto the banana and be, his mind will be fixated on the banana that you can just walk right up to him and grab him. I believe that fossil fuels 
were a monkey trap that was set for us before we even evolved. Fossil fuels took 300 million years to form and we found them and with all our brain structure and our social structure, what we did, how could it have been otherwise? I don't know how we could have done things differently. So we too are a super organism like the ants. Um, we've attained ultra sociality. So yes, we have individual drivers where we want status and respect and we want to advertise our peacock feathers to move up the mating ladder. But on a higher level, we have a super organism, which is our civilization, which has access an energy gradient the same way that an old growth forest has. And it's going to be very difficult to give it up. And I don't know, again, I'm not a climate expert, but if they're talking, if they're in the realm of being right, we're going to have to. Good, that was worth putting that slide in. <laughs> so we've created um, kind of a Rube Goldberg machine of, of epic proportion. And in the 1970s in Oshkosh, 90% of the food was made and processed within 150 miles of here. Now it comes from all over the place, including the world. The average supermarket has 88,000 items. And yes, most of those items are made as cheaply as they possibly could, with of course a huge dollop of, of fossil transportation um, underpinning them. But we don't need that many items. So um, my apologies to those at the business table, but this is um, what I've experienced over the last decade or so. Um, this is actually my, my usual talk, which takes an hour, and I'm going to do it in two minutes. So um, these are some core things with economic theory. And again, I have nothing against economists. Um, they just, what, the textbooks are now wrong. And I don't expect them to change overnight. In fact, I had to call one of my old professors while you all were eating dinner, and he just debated some economist protege of Julian Simon, a famous cornucopian. And um, he said, there's absolutely no environmental problem. We can just build structures to keep the sea out of cities, and it's all a money issue. And, and he said the audience actually booed the people. But I, I diverged. So number one, the human system is not a straight line system. We are part of nature and our system is a polynomial, the same as any biological species. We just made the rules during this part of it that doesn't apply to, it's, it's not a natural law. Uh, number two is um, the economy is part of the environment, not vice versa. Most economic textbooks will say the environment is part of the economy, you just need to put the right prices on, etc. There is no price that you can put on fresh air or a species loss, uh, et cetera. Number three, energy is everything. And energy is the primary driver of um, productivity. Economics textbooks say that it's capital and labor, and they ignore energy, which is uh, the dependent variable on the other two. Um, number four, that oil is priced um, the same way as other commodities, when in actuality it is um, irreplaceable on, on any human time scale. Uh, number five, that technology is the reason that we are so profitable, um, when in fact technology has been losing the race with depletion. Because if you look at biophysical metrics, if we go from 100 to 1 to 30 to 1 to 10 to 1 to something less, there will be a diesel shortage in the next five years, assuming everything holds together in the Bakken shale, because they're needing at least one-eighth of a barrel of diesel for every barrel they get out of uh, North and South Dakota. And that doesn't count the natural gas or, or some of the other machinery. So there, we are, in the media, they talk about gross production, and we really need to concern ourselves with net. Um, number six, um, Standard economics text treat debt as neutral to an economy. It just means that someone's saving and the other person is consuming. But if debt productivity is below one and we live on a finite planet, there's a problem with that assumption. 
Uh, number seven, wants equals needs. Um, we, we talked about that. And number eight, when I was in MBA school at University of Chicago, um, I believed this was the case then, and it probably was, is that financial sector of the economy was the cleaner fish. That we would make other things more efficient and healthier. And maybe it used to be that way, but now it's morphed into a barracuda. And many of our decisions are made just for the sake of making more digits on digits and ignoring social equity, environmental, um, and productive uses. The biggest shortcoming of economics is the invisible hand. Um, there is no plan B. If economics starts to fail or the assumptions are not correct, th there's no plan for what happens then. Which is why, in my experience, and I've been talking to governments in the world and institutions, every single major government leader I've talked to is surrounded by someone who is either financially or economically trained or is themselves. And it's, um, it's very powerful. So, okay, now my mom's going to be embarrassed. But when I was young, I was kind of a problem child. She, I, I remember the, the term many times. She said that I could never be satisfied and that I was a problem child. But here I am with my cousin stealing his gun. Um, and I was kind of a problem adult too. I mean, I've, I've seen and done things that if I died tomorrow, I've had a very full experience living on this planet. Um, and I've consumed probably per capita more energy and oil than anyone in this room during my life. But I kind of turned out okay now. I've kind of seen the light. I live in a very small house. Um, I live on about $35,000 a year. And I eschew a lot of the um, glitzy, high-end stuff that I used to be you know, deep in. And the reason I show this is from many perspectives, we humans are Mother Nature's problem child. And uh, we laugh about it, but um, something is going to have to change with our relationship with the planet. And I think a synthesis of natural and social science, looking at our natural resource source and sink balance sheets and the balance sheet of, of, of what drives us um, truly behavioral, what makes us happy or satisfied rather than all this um, rat race consumption. So GDP is what we measure our success by right now, gross domestic product. We are doing everything possible to keep that pie inflated. We've borrowed from the past in the form of fossil fuels. We borrow from the present in the form of social equity. We borrow from uh, the environment, as I said before, about the 20 industries and externalities, and we're also borrowing from the future. Because energy we use today cannot be used in the future or the energy remaining in the future will be a lot more expensive. So let me talk a little bit about renewable energy. Renewable energy is the answer. It's just not the answer that most people are thinking. Um, 100 years from now, we will have to be on almost exclusively renewable energy. But the issue we face is not one of resource scarcity. There is plenty of oil and natural gas and coal in the ground. Let's assume climate change is not the issue for the time being. The issue is one of resource contribution. We have reached where the primary drivers of growth, cheap energy to build this ginormous system, and lately, credit. We've added more and more credit just to keep things afloat. So the issue is not how much resources are out there, is what is the price of those resources relative to our situation. And for the last 40 years, we built a civilization based on a 20 to 1 energy return. In other words, we would spend 5% of our energy and the other 95% went to Disneyland and cheap flights to visit grandma and cheap food, et cetera. And now we're moving to a, an era, whether with renewables or without, where it's gonna be 10 or 15% of our energy needs to go to the energy sector. 
So renewables also have some other problems in that they're intermittent and uh, spatially diffuse and, and they don't have the, the same quality as fossil fuels. I view renewables as essential and they're fossil fuel extenders. They give us some more time and ultimately we're going to have to live back with renewables, but it's going to be at a much lower standard of living than today. Or I should say a much lower um, throughput. We could be happier and healthier, but we're going to use less. So very quickly, um, these four areas, the green represents up until the 1970s, when during that time, debt productivity, or energy productivity started to decline. And then the yellow area was the 70s to the year 2000, when we started adding debt in massive quantities to offset the, the energy depletion. And then the red has been the last six or seven years where the central banks have started to take over the model. <clears throat> I believe that we're, as soon as the government doesn't raise the debt ceiling or anything along those lines, that debt uh, growth is over in the U.S. and we're not prepared for it. Um, I think the four trajectories I, I drew here, um, in the future, I, I think the absolute best case would be the top one, the blue line, um, if we have some um, energy uh, invention or new technology, but it's going to be costly in the sense that it will probably require, uh, involve environmental externalities. So if we could freeze people in time, what sort of system would work? Well, this is a, a graph of um, GNP versus uh, subjective well-being. And when you're very poor, an increase in GDP gives you massive increases in, in well-being, health, and happiness. But once you reach a, a level, uh, an intermediate level, no matter how much more you make, you'd have very marginal increases in, in happiness. And on a planet where there's so much social inequity in our country as well, um, and what I'm going to talk about in a minute is intergenerational, inequity, um, some sort of contraction and conversion make, makes sense. Whether this is politically feasible or not, I'm not going to say, but I think that's the natural direction we're going to go. So in the 1950s, no one thought that we could walk on the moon, send a man to the moon and walk. And even in the early 60s when they started working on it, but we did it. I actually think that's now a uh, cultural thorn for us because we went and we flew to the moon and we walked on it. And it's like any technical challenge that we face, we can, we can do it. Manhattan Project, let's get everything together and we'll come up with some renewable energy to offset these problems I've talked about. And we have a cultural belief in miracles like that. And I think this is a, a handicap, this belief. So when we talk about the problems that I'm talking about, basically the end of growth with a ginormous asterisk of climate change and a, a changing um, natural world, there is no natural champion to help us with this. I've talked to senior people in government who are afraid for their jobs. They agree with the analysis, but they, it's too much for them to, to handle. I've talked to billionaires. They're very interested in this, but ultimately they kind of want to see maybe I should shift my investments this way or that. They didn't get to be billionaires by thinking about these issues. Um, I've, I've talked to corporations. Again, a lot of people, I mean, I think that five years ago, this talk might have sounded totally whacked. But now I think a lot of people kind of get it that the planet is finite. We've used a lot of the good stuff. We're kind of at a transition zone. What's going to happen? But corporations have ultimately a profit motive. They have to answer to their shareholders. So to donate money to something that might end up in the end of growth trajectory that's not going to help them at all is just not. So, so ultimately, I've come to the conclusion that we have to look to ourselves. Um, and that might be kind of tough, but I do think that people, when they understand enough of the situation, not everyone, but some people will, will make some significant changes. American exceptionalism is something that's 
misunderstood, strongly misunderstood, as if Americans had some God-given right to this amount of resource consumption and this standard of living. If you strip away, um, we have extracted and consumed more oil than any other country in the world. If you strip that away and the, the wide open spaces and natural resources of the last 200 years, what's left is our, our spirit, our ethic, our who we are as a person, as, as a nation. And um, how are we going to respond when the economy is getting smaller every year um, is, is an open question. A natural inclination to hearing about some of these things is, well, I'm worried about money, I'm going to buy some gold or guns or something. And I, I think 50 years from now, I think the heroes in our society are not going to, any of them have golds or gun, uh, gold or guns. I think um, there are going to be many more pro-social options. And so um, while cognitively this might make sense, it's just an extension of this, um, I need to store my wealth, screw everyone else. And I, and I think, I expect and I hope that that dynamic is going to change. If climate change was something hurtling at us from outer space, that would be kind of more in line with the saber-toothed tiger. And we might like mobilize to, if this asteroid was going to hit us in 50 years, I think we would do something about it. The fact that it means you have to use less you have to reduce your consumption, is so anti our genetic and cultural trajectory that it's, it's very, very difficult. Um, and a lot of the climate activists I know have kids and eat meat and drive, and, but they're really worried. And there's this uh, cognitive dissonance that is in a lot of us, you know, myself included. So one thing I think is pretty important um, and I think has not happened so far as we blame a lot of our problems on outgroups. And it's the such and such, such president, the Democrats or the Republicans or the, um, the Muslims or the environmentalists or the rich or the Chinese. It's really nobody's fault. This is a biophysical situation that we've kind of gotten into and um, there's going to be some very interesting trajectories that ensue. But to, to, to make our group smaller and blame others is a natural tendency. But I, I think we have to resist that. So given everything that I've talked about, what is there to look forward to? Well, there's quite a lot. So who's that? That's your son. That was on, uh, that was on uh, Renaissance Festival Day. Um, when I was a kid, we consumed per capita one third of what we do today. I had a great childhood. John Maynard Keynes in 1930 predicted that 100 years from then, which is 17 years from now, that our productivity would be such that Americans would only have to work 17, uh, 15 hours a day the rest would be leisure time. So we could, huh? A week, 15 hours a week? 15 hours a day. I, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, 15 hours a week. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Usually there's beer at these events. And I'm... <laughs> um, so 15 hours as opposed to 40. And um, so we could, in the future, cut our consumption in half and cut how many hours a week we work in half and we'd be back down to the per capita level of when I was a kid. Um, a lot of these are the, the middle top picture are two of my best friends who grew up in Wisconsin, similar childhoods. That's my dog in the lower left. Um, you, you can, we can do that and I, it, it's eminently possible. There's no correlation with, uh, I, I didn't have the graph on here, but um, we use 38 times the energy per capita as the average person in the Philippines, yet on all subjective well-being studies, we're just as happy. They are just as happy as us. So the problem is, is that we have no plan to get to that level. 
because of our infrastructure, et cetera. So knowing some of the RSVPs that came here tonight, um, I know we have at least some atheists and some Christians. And I never talk about religion, but I'm going to mention it now because I think it's important for two reasons. Um, number one is that what's coming has to be dealt with and planned for and addressed by us. No one's going to bail us out. Um, and number two is our deep-rooted, core, evolved penchant for empathy and cooperation and helping each other. That evolved in us in our hunter-gatherer tribal setting hundreds of thousands of years ago, way before it was told by an institution or in a book. And I believe that whatever's coming in the future, that we will rely on that cooperative, uh, empathic spirit. So basically, um, <laughs> I, I have about five more minutes. Um, some of you may be first exposed to some of the things I've said tonight. Um, and the end of growth, hearing about that and all this energy is magic. As adults, you might have the same feeling now as, as you did when you found Santa Claus was not real. But the magic now is inexorably going away. And right now, it seems like we have the same amount of magic. We're just using more of the magic itself to, to have the gross level. Um, but it's going to become more expensive over time. So we have to change our definition of what we consider magic. I don't know how many of you uh, saw the movie uh, Citizen Kane. It was voted one of the best movies of all time. Yeah. He was... Uh, billionaire, magnate, and he always had a little wish, a fondness, a recollection of something he couldn't quite place, and he was anxious and upset. And it turns out at the end of the movie that it was his boyhood sled, um, Rosebud. He kept saying the word Rosebud. I think that humanity's Rosebud is our connection with nature, and that we've, in all the pell-mell of the rat race of, of modern day, that we've, we've lost that connection. So to the title of my talk, what if the future is real? How many of you thought about what Oshkosh will look like a hundred years from now? What the climate will be like? What the water's like? What people's living standards will be? It's not something that we naturally think about. I think in very real ways, um, we evolved to get here by relative fitness, by competing with others. And now, for the first time really in our species history, we're competing with our descendants. Think of them as someone that's downriver from us. All of our activities in the river, whether we pollute in it or um, they impact our descendants, but they can't impact us. It's kind of a profound way to think about things, um, and it's not natural. So this is uh, the monkey let go of the banana. And my 14-year-old stepdaughter drew this. And she said, no, that, that's not the whole story. And I said, well, what do you mean? And then she, she drew a female monkey <laughs> that was impressed that the monkey let go of the banana. I had to pay her $15 last night to draw this. So. This talk covered a lot of um, new territory, I expect, for a lot of you. Um, and I think it, it was a risky talk because these are not things that are prevalent in our discussions. Um, but I'd like to think that some of you, especially the young people, when I was saying some of these things about who we are and how we got here, a little voice in your head say, yes, that I kind of resonates with me. I, that makes sense. And 
I don't need a donation. I don't need you to sign up any petition. I just want you to think, what if the future is real? And of all the momentous, amazing things that have brought us through history to this day, we're made up of billions of small little decisions that only now our history teachers look back and can as ascribe a narrative to. No one 100 years ago or 200 years ago could have predicted what we are doing now. And the people that got close had a systemic view. Something about the presentation I gave tonight is, is trying to put the whole picture together. So what you can do maybe is do what I did and try and make a decision, a calm, minor decision, that your definition of success in your life will be at least partially attributed to you standing with the elephants and the whales and the dolphins and the unborn generations of humans in the future because they are very real. There's seven billion humans alive today. Um, so back to the last uh, 200,000 years, it works out to about 90 billion humans have lived and died on the planet. I don't see any reason why um, we couldn't get to a trillion humans. And I think we need to incorporate that into our thinking. A baby is an incredibly fragile thing. A trillionth baby, human baby, is even more fragile because it's in the future and it hasn't happened yet, but it's gonna be impacted by, by our decisions. And these are the type of conversations that are happening in far too few places. That's all I had, thanks.